Okay, everyone. Today is the day of Yom Kippur. Um, and again, every year around the four Moedim, we always revisit these topics. It's, it's a well that never runs dry. Um, there's always something new to find out. And at the end of the day, it's our king that has asked us to revisit these things every year. Apparently, we seem to be quite a forgetful people. We need constant reminders, which is why I believe he asks us year in, year out, you will focus on these appointed times and what they mean and what they point to. Uh, so yeah, today, what does today mean? This year was another year where I'm revisiting, you know, the Torah, the, the Torah in regards to the Yom Kippur ceremony and I picked up on something I'd missed, <laughs> which I want to share today. But again, for those, there's a lot of new people that are waking up at the minute. And so today I want to, you know, revisit certain things. But for those of us who have been doing this a bit longer, as Peter would say, I'm going to keep reminding you of these things over and over again until the putting off my tent. And when I'm gone, I'm going to make sure there's something in place to keep reminding you over and over again. So here I am today, hopefully fulfilling that function in reminding you of some certain things and um, hopefully seeing some new things. Um, so, Leviticus 23. We have to start here, obviously. Verse 26. And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh new moon is Yom HaKippurim, so the day of atonement months, plural. People miss that one. It's actually, there's a, it is called Yom Kippur as well, but it's also called Yom HaKippurim, which is in the plural form. Multiple atonements, as we will see. It shall be a set-apart gathering for you, hence why we're here. And you shall afflict your beings, and shall bring an offering made by fire to Yah. And you do no work on that same day, for it is Yom Kippurim, to make atonement for you before Yah your Elohim. For any being who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And any being who does not work on that same day, I shall destroy from the midst of this people. We're not going to cover today, should you fast or should you not, what is affliction of the being. I did that last year as part of the Moedim series. We've got other things to look at today, so I'm not going to address that today. Um, you do no work, a law forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It is a Sabbath of rest to you, and you shall afflict your beings. On the ninth day of the new moon, at evening, from evening to evening, you observe your Sabbath. So here you have Yah telling you how he reckons days. Um, now Leviticus 23 is quite a, a broad, uh, it gives you the main bullet points of his Moedim. However, the Yom Kippur ceremony is actually listed out in Leviticus 16. Yeah, Leviticus 16, and it goes quite in detail. But, as I found, it doesn't give you all the details. There's a couple of details that I'd missed, and I guess this is my way of saying, sorry guys, I'd missed something. It's a very small thing in the ceremony, but when you understand what it points to, it has a huge effect. So, I'm going to bullet point out what happened during the ceremony, uh, because if not, we're going to read a, a whole chapter of about 45, 50 verses. Um, but we are going to look at certain points of it. So the high priest would take off his high priestly garb, so the garments of glory, they're called, that he would bathe in water and put on regular priestly clothing. So he would have been wearing white linen and he would have looked like an ordinary priest. There's a huge typology here that we'll get to later. Two identical goats were selected and made to stand in front of the tabernacle, um, in spe specifically in the tabernacle court outside the holy place. Lots were then drawn, one for Elohim and one as a scapegoat. Now, I'm not going to do a big thing on the goat, well, is it Azazel? What is Azazel? Um, we simply actually don't know. 
because is it a, the name, some people, there's four main views. Is it the name of a demon or a fallen angel? Is it a place? Or does it just mean goat of going away? Because you have two words, you have Az and Azal being put together. We're not going to go into that because this is something that's actually uh, divided, scholarly opinion. Um, personally, I think it's the goat of going away. It kind of fits, it's simple. Um, I won't get into it too much, but I actually think if you're going to put this sin upon something else, you're actually attacking the plan of redemption. Think who, who was the sin of the cosmos laid upon? It was laid upon Messiah. To then send that onto some demonic entity? I have a slight issue with that, but that's just my opinion. Um, chew on that one for thought. The one for Elohim becomes a sin offering. The other would be sent into the wilderness, to a land cut off, it says in the Hebrew. A bull would be slain. So right now, the goats have not been slain. They've been chosen, okay? Which one will be which is chosen. The bull would be slain to make atonement for the high priest and the household of priests. He had to, because he was a fallen man too. The high priest would enter into the sanctuary with the blood of the bull, take coals from the altar of incense, and he would also have incense in his hand. The coals and incense would create a cloud that covered the Ark of the Covenant when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies. It doesn't say which part of the tabernacle the priest actually made the cloud. It doesn't actually say, which I find is an interesting... So, so, sometimes things are conspicuous by their absence. It doesn't tell you where he makes the puff of cloud. The blood of the bull was sprinkled on the east side of the lid of atonement and seven times in front of the lid of the ark. The high priest would then come back out, slaughter the goat on which the lot for Elohim landed on and would do the same with its blood as he did with that of the bull. So sprinkle it on the east side, then seven times in front and then he would come back out. He would then take the blood of the bull and the goat and put it on the horns of the golden altar. This is what I'd missed the whole time and sprinkled the altar seven times because when you read, we'll read this in a second because when you read it, it just says the altar in front of Yah and it's always something I've had a question about, the altar in front of Yah, like that seems to point towards the golden altar but when you read it, because uh, you've got to remember that in the Hebrew, um, it uses the same word for both the golden altar and the altar out in front, out in the courtyard where the sacrifices would be uh, sacrificed on. But I, it's, it's in the Torah. It's actually speaking of the golden altar. We'll get to that. This has got huge ramifications, by the way. The remainder of the blood was poured out at the base of the sacrificial altar. This made an atonement for the set-apart place and the tabernacle due to the uncleanness of the children of Israel. This is why it's the Day of Atonement's plural, because the tabernacle itself needed to be cleansed and atoned for, as well as the nation. So there's multiple atonements going on. During this time, only the high priest was allowed into the tabernacle. When all of this was going on, he had to be the only one going into the tabernacle in fact, he would have had to do all the offerings himself, which when you actually realise how many offerings there were, it's a hefty job. And again, this plays out, it's a beautiful typology of what our Messiah did. The high priest would then lay his hands on the live goat, this is the one that was, the lot was drawn to be sent out, and confess over it the sin of the children of Israel. The live goat was then sent out into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. The one who led the live goat away was to bathe in water after, before returning into the camp. There's a typo there. It actually made him unclean, ritually. He had to bathe in water and he was unclean until evening because he led the goat away. The high priest would take of the regular priestly garb he would take off, sorry, the regular priestly garb, bathe in water and then put the high priestly garb back on. 
So he's now back in the high priestly garments of glory. He would then prepare the two rams as ascending offerings, one for himself and one for the people to make atonement for them both. People miss out the two rams. They just think the two goats and maybe the bull for the priesthood, but there were also two rams as well uh, on top of this, uh, of the other sacrifices. The carcasses of the bull and the goat, whose blood had been brought into the Holy of Holies, were brought outside the camp and burnt with fire in a set-apart place. Normally, this is in stark contrast, whereas normally sacrifices would be burnt on the altar of sacrifice. These were taken outside of the camp. The one who brought the carcasses out and burned them with fire had to bathe in water before returning into the camp. This made him unclean too. So that's an outline of the Yom Kippur ceremony. Now, I mentioned that the blood was actually sprinkled on the horns of the golden altar. When you read this in Leviticus 16, it's not so obvious because it just tells you the altar in front, uh, which is before Yah, sorry, or in the face of Yah. So which altar is it? And I started doing some digging on this. So this is the, in Leviticus 16, which outlines the Yom Kippur ceremony. Verse 17 says, No man should be in the tent of appointment when he goes in to make the atonement in the set-apart place until he comes out, and he shall make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel, and he shall go out to the slaughter place, the altar, that is before Yah, and make atonement for it. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the slaughter place all around. It, it's a bit ambiguous. I actually think the fact that it says it's before Yah is the giveaway. But this was something that I always wondered. Is it the altar of sacrifice? Is it the, altar, the golden altar? Is it maybe both? And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on its, with its finger seven times and cleanse it and set it apart from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Notice the lingo here that in doing so he's cleansing it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Why? When you understand how the sacrifices were performed in the Torah, this statement makes perfect sense. So let's look at certain passages in the Torah. Exodus 30 verse 6. You shall put it, speaking of the golden altar, the altar of incense, before the veil that is before the ark of the witness, before the lid of atonement that is over the witness, where I am to meet with you. So right here, it's, in, it, it's before Yah. And Aharon shall burn on it sweet incense morning by morning as he tends the lamps, and he shall burn incense on it. When Aharon lights the lamps between the evenings, he shall burn incense on it, a continual incense before Yah throughout your generations. Now, what does incense represent? The prayers of the saints. So think about this. The altar needs, it needs to be cleansed. Do not offer strange incense on it or an ascending offering or a grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. So it's clearly speaking of the altar of incense here. Aharon shall make atonement upon its horns once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Right there. It's telling you. How? Once a year he makes atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most set apart to Yah. The Hebrew here for sin offering of atonement is chata'at, which is the, the sin offering or the sin, hakipurim. It literally says chata'at hakipurim. Once a year he shall make atonement for it. Ah, it was right there all along. Leviticus 4. Okay, so now that we know that it's the altar of incense that is been, um, the, is been uh, applied with the blood, let's keep going because this opened up a really interesting rabbit trail for me. Leviticus 4 verse 1. Yah spoke to Moshe saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, When a being sins by mistake, against any of the commands of Yah, which are not to be done, and shall do any of them, if the anointed priest sins. Now, did the high priest have to come in with an offering for his sins? Yeah. Yes, he did. If the anointed priest sing, sins, 
bringing guilt upon the people, then he shall bring to Yah for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull, a perfect one, as a sin offering. The word there again is chata'at, which is the same word going back here, the sin offering that is going to be put on the horns of the altar, the blood of it, chata'at hakipurim, but there's going to be a key difference, okay, so we'll get to that. And he shall bring the bull to the tent of the door of appointment before Yah and shall lay his hand on the bull's head and slay the bull before Yah. If the anointed priest, then the anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and bring it into the tent of appointment. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before Yah. Now this is in front of the curtain. So this is how you know that back in Leviticus 16, that the altar before Yah, it's speaking of the altar that's within the holy place, in front of the veil of the set-apart place. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the slaughter place of sweet incense before Yah. So this happened throughout the year. If the anointed priest sinned, he would have to slay a bull, lay his hands on it, well, brick, lay his hands on it, then slay the bull, bring the blood in, and look at where he's putting the blood. He's putting it on the altar of incense, which is before Yah, which is in the tent of appointment, and you shall pour all the blood of the bull at the base of the slaughter place of the ascending offering. So that's the sacrificial altar which is at the door of the tent of appointment. So here we're seeing how you deal with this. The Torah is telling you, you sprinkle the blood on the horns of the altar, you bring the rest of the blood out, you pour it at the base of the sacrificial altar. Let's keep going. If the entire congregation of Yisrael strays by mistake. Now, who was the day of atonement? What was the atonement for? Who was it for? The nation of Israel, and before that, it was for the priesthood. So again, you're seeing... Anyway, if the entire congregation of Israel strays by mistake, notice it's by mistake, and the matter has been hidden from the eyes of the assembly, and they have done against any of the commands of Yah, which are not to be done, and shall be guilty, when the sin which they have sinned becomes known, then the assembly shall bring a young bull for the sin. Now, it's the same word here, chata'at. So the, the word chata'at is used both for the sin and for the offering itself. It's implied that it's for the offering. And bring it before the tent of appointment. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before Yah, and the bull be slain before Yah. And the anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood to the tent of appointment, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood, sprinkle it seven times before Yah in front of the veil, and put some of the blood on the horns of the slaughter place which is before Yah. So we're just reading on from the accidental sin offerings of the high priest, of the priest here which is telling you, which is in the tent of the appointment. There's only one altar that's in the tent of the appointment, inside it, and that's the altar of incense, because the altar of sacrifice is outside in the courtyard. Pour all the blood at the base of the slaughter place of ascending offering, that's the, the one that's outdoors, which is at the door of the tent of the appointment. Can people clearly see here what's going on? This is crucially important to really understand what the, the Yom Kippur ceremony is pointing to. Hebrews 9.7 says this, Into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, so we know it's Yom Kippur, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of ignorance of the people. It's for the sins of ignorance. What, what have we just been reading here? If a being sins by mistake... Don't freak out, guys. Don't freak out. Like, the blood of Messiah does cover everything. <laughs> we'll get to that. But why do you think the book of Hebrews is saying the blood of bulls could never take away sin? Because here, it's only talking about sins of ignorance. It's pointing to something. There's something really crucial 
about laying hands on the sacrifice that I think people have missed. I've missed this up until this year. The offerings we've just seen, which were for the accidental sins, involved the guilty party laying hands on the offering, which most people would agree is pointing to this transferal of sin, this substitution that's going on. A bit how Isaac was laid on the altar and instead Yah provided a sacrifice. There was this substitution going on. Now, when I'm talking about the offerings we've just been reading, I'm talking about these offerings would have happened throughout the year. These are not Yom Kippurim offerings. When are being sins by mistake? Okay? When is being sins by mistake? That's whenever. The blood of that offering would be brought into the set apart place. Now, blood cries out, does it not? What does Yah say about the blood of Abel? It cries out to me. We know when he's speaking prophetically, he will avenge the blood of those that, um, he will avenge his people and their blood. Why? Because it cries out. This means that every time blood is being brought into the tabernacle, there's actually a record and a witness of the sin it covered. Does that make sense? Because remember, think the high, let's say the anointed priest sins, he puts his hands on the bull, confessing his sin over it, that blood is then brought into the tabernacle and put on the horns of the golden altar. That's now, there's a record of sin in the, altar, in the tabernacle, crying out before Yah. The sin offerings of the people of Israel throughout the year simply added to the record of sin in the set-apart place, hence why it needed cleansing every year. What, what is the day of Yom HaKippurim? What, what did we read in Leviticus? Uh, that this has to occur to cleanse the tabernacle from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. The, there's something, the, the uncleanness of the children of Israel needed to be atoned for because it was being brought into the tabernacle. And I never fully understood why. It's because blood cries out. It's a record. It's a witness. And the tabernacle needed to be cleansed from that. Look, I'm not talking magical hocus pocus here. This is a shadow picture, but it's meant to teach you something. Now, knowing all of this, here's what's unique about the Yom Kippur ceremony. I'd never spotted this. We read right through it. We don't read critically. Leviticus 16 verse 3. With this, Aaron should come into the set-apart place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and as a ram of a, uh, as an ascending offering. And from the congregation of Israel, he takes two male goats as a sin offering, one ram as an ascending offering. And Aaron shall bring the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and let them stand before Yah at the door of the tent of appointment. And Aharon shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for Yah and the other lot for Azazel. Again, I'm, I don't want to get into that today. And Aharon shall bring the goat on which the lot for Yah fell and shall prepare it as a sin offering. What's not happened? Something's not happened in the usual ceremony. keep going but the goat on which the lot for Azazel is fell is caused to stand alive before Yah to make atonement upon it to send it into the wilderness to Azazel here is the key difference there's no instruction for the laying on of hands of these two sin offerings the bull that was brought on behalf of the priest and that goat on behalf of the children of Israel there's no laying on of hands mentioned Meaning the blood used for cleansing the set-apart place has no record of sin. Are people seeing what this now points to? Sinless blood is required to cleanse the house, is what it's telling you. Sinless blood. Because there's no transferal of sin on these animals. Ah, oh, but Michael, yeah, yeah, trust me, let's keep reading. And when he is finished atoning for the set-apart place, by the way, who is the temple of Yah? We are. we are. How we atone for? By sinless blood. And the tent of appointment and the slaughter place, he shall bring the live goat 
Then Aharon shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and shall confess over it all the crookedness of the children of Israel. This is how you know this hasn't happened to the other two animals. All of the children of Israel, all of their crookedness, all their transgressions and all their sins, and shall put them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a fit man. It needed to be this way. Remember, throughout the year, you have the anointed priest who sins and the congregation of Israel who will sin by mistake. And what are they doing? They're laying their hands on the offering, confessing their sin, bringing the blood in to the tabernacle and putting it on the horns of the golden altar. And then they're bringing the rest of the blood out and pouring it at the base of the altar, which means that there's a record of sin. However, with the with, the, with the, these first two offerings, there's no laying on of hands or confession of sin over them, which means that the blood that's going into the tabernacle has no record of sin. It does not witness or cry out. We know this because it's on the live goat that all of the sin is confessed over and that goat is taken outside the camp. Where was Messiah crucified? Outside the camp. And I'd missed this the whole time. The trans the, this idea of sinless blood cleansing the house. This is what the Yom Kippur ceremony is pointing to. That sinless blood would be required to atone for the house of Yah, which is the house of Israel. And the goat shall bear on itself all their crookednesses to a land cut off, and he shall send the goat away into the wilderness. So again, it's this, this is why he, uh, the, the apostles use this language, let us now bear the shame and go outside the camp and bear the shame of it. It's an allusion not only to this, but also obviously pointing to Messiah. Isaiah 53 verse 4, truly he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. So you see Yeshua actually fulfilling both obligations here. He did it all. Now again, who was to officiate this ceremony in the shadow picture? The high priest. Who else was allowed in at the time? No one. The high priest did it alone. Which is again, it's pointing you that Messiah alone will be able to do this redemption. Not by your blood, not by your works, but by what he's done. He carried it. By the way, this is why I struggle with the, the goat of Azazel being all the sin being put onto a demon. Because what you're saying is Yeshua is a demon. The sin of the cosmos was put upon Messiah, not upon some angelic fallen thing called Azazel. Okay, so what Azazel means, look, we can argue, but the simplest thing is Az, which it means goat, and then Azal, which means to send away. He, Messiah, bore our sicknesses and carried our pains, yet we reckoned him smitten, stricken by Elohim, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our crookedness, the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. We all like sheep went astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. And Yah has laid on him the crookedness of us all. Look, in the shadow picture, the goat was innocent. Poor goat didn't do nothing wrong. In the same way, our Messiah, completely innocent. Now, this idea of the horns of the altar is woven throughout. In fact, it was so deeply embedded in their culture and in their understanding that, again, we read right over this. Who here knows the idea of grabbing hold of the horns of the altar? And it's speaking of the sacrificial altar. Let's look at this because remember what's being atoned for here, the altar. Okay, there's this idea of the horns being something specific. Exodus 21.12, he who strikes a man so that he dies shall certainly be put to death. This is, this is murder. But if he did not lie in wait, but Elohim delivered him into his hand, then I shall appoint for you a place where he is to flee. So this is the cities of refuge. 
But when a man acts presumptuously against his neighbour, so this is premeditated, to kill him by treachery, you are to take him even from my slaughter place, my altar, to die? What's this murderer doing grabbing hold of the horns of the altar? Ah, uh, Michael, it's speaking figuratively. We're going to see, actually, no, this was a very real thing. It was a very real thing. that We're going to see that if you grabbed hold of the horns of the altar, you weren't allowed to, uh, you had to be heard out, basically. You were able, if you were able to, like, so we know there were cities of refuge, right? Well, you could go to where the altar was and grab hold of the horns of the altar. But Yah's saying, if this guy's truly a murderer, you rip him from it, you put him to death. I will not allow murderers to use this grace, this favour, this mercy and compassion for their own self-gain. Do, do, do people see that? Let's keep reading in other places. 1 Kings 1. Verse 50, Solomon is king right now. This is your context. King Solomon is on the throne. And Adoniyahu was Adoniyah or Adonijah is the English, I think. He was afraid of Shlomo, of Solomon, and rose and went and took hold of the horns of the slaughter place. And it was reported to Solomon saying, look, Adoniyahu is afraid of sovereign Shlomo. And look, he has taken hold of the horns of the slaughter place, the altar, saying, let Sovereign Shlomo swear to me today that he does not put his servant to death with the sword. If you read earlier in, in the passage, this is Solomon's brother. It's one of his brothers who usurped the throne of David. Okay, but he's like, oh, my father's getting old and, you know, I, I need to be king. And this is when Solomon and Nathan the prophet anoint King Solomon. And Adoniyahu is that like, can you understand now why Adoniyahu is afraid for his life? Because he usurped the throne and now Solomon's been rightfully made the king. And he's thinking, I'm in deep trouble. And Shlomo said, if he proves himself a worthy man, not one hair of him is going to fall to the earth. But if evil is found in him, then he shall die. It's really interesting what he's saying there. Like, do you think that Solomon understands what Torah is pointing to? <laughs> and sovereign Shlomo said, and they brought him down from before the slaughter place. Now look at this. He came and fell down before the sovereign Shlomo. Is that arrogance or is that repentance? It's repentance. And Shlomo said to him, go to your house. So this man, by grabbing hold, he knew he was in trouble. He grabs hold of the horns of the altar and he pleads for mercy. By the way, how many corners on the altar? Would you say that the horns are maybe like wings? Right? Where, what do we grab? Look at the typology. Grabbing hold of the hem of the zitzitz of Messiah is right there to look for mercy if you're found worthy. And how was he found worthy? Repentance. Look, Adoniyahu was guilty and he knew it. He absolutely knew he was guilty, yet he showed humility and repentance and he was spared. Now, Let's read an event that happened not long after. Literally the next chapter, the news came to Joab, or Joab. So Joab was Dave, one of David's commanders. And he, when David died, he, Joab continued to work as one of the commanders. For Joab had turned aside after Adoniyah. This is the guy that's just been clinging onto the horns of the altar. He was one of the people that was part of the conspiracy. Though he did not turn aside after Absalom. So the, the text is saying, okay, he didn't go after the usurping of Absalom, but he did with Adoniyahu. And Joab fled to the tent of Yah and took hold of the horns of the slaughter place. He's thinking, Adoniyah got away with it. Maybe I can too. And the report came to Sovereign Shlomo that Joab had fled to the tent of Yah. And see, he is by the slaughter place. That, like, this is how you know it's literally talking. They were there by the altar. Then Shlomo sent Benayahu, son of Jehoiada, saying, go fall on him. It, go put a sword through him, that means. 
But so ben who came to the tent of Yah and said to him, Thus said the sovereign, Come out. And he said, No, for I die here. Are we seeing repentance or pride? Pride. And ben who brought back the word to the sovereign, saying, Thus said Joab, and thus he answered me. Which means that Joab is not showing remorse. He's standing firm on his decision. And the sovereign said to him, Do as he said. His own words came back upon him and fall upon him and you shall bury him so that you take away from me and from my house, the house of my father, the blood which Joab shed without cause. In fact, it explains, I think, thus Yah shall return his blood on his head because he had fallen on two men more righteous and better than he. This was during the reign of David. And David did not, and killed them with the sword, while my father David did not know it. Avner, son of Ner, and commander of the army of Israel, and Amasa, son of Yeter, commander of the army of Yehuda. Solomon knew about this, right? Now here's the thing. Joab has just demonstrated what's in his heart. He's clung onto the horns of the altar and he goes, nope, I die here. Fine, have it your way. What did Adoniah do? He submitted. He pleaded for mercy and it was granted to him. Notice the stark contrast. So their blood shall return upon their head, the head of Joab, and upon the head of his seed forever. But upon David and his seed, upon his house and his throne, there is to be peace forever from Yah. Then Benayahu, son of Jehoiada, went up and fell on him and put him to death. And he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. So clearly, grabbing hold of, grabbing hold of the horns of the altar was not a get out of jail free card. It was a place where you got to be heard. Now, we all have a judgment coming up, right? And where we're going to have to be heard by Messiah and give an account for every word and every action we've done. I believe this is telling you, right, and if this is a typology of grabbing hold of the edges of the garment of Messiah, it's telling you what's expected. It says that um, those who were thrown out of the wedding feast were thrown out because they were unworthy. Then we know that one of the reports to the assembly of Sardis, that if they overcome... They will walk with him in white because they are worthy. I believe this is telling you how to be, you repent. <laughs> know that you've screwed up. Don't justify. Now, why is this important? Again, remember what was being atoned for on the Day of Atonement. Where was the blood applied to the horns? Horns represented power, by the way. The horn, you, you see this idiomatic expression in the scripture, the horn of a king. It's not speaking that the king's literally got horns. It's a symbol of his power and his authority. This is why um, in the book of Revelation, you've got these horns on the beast. They're symbols of authority and power. Amos 3.13. This is an indictment. From Yah to the house of Israel. Hear and witness against the house of Yaakov. So this is all 12 tribes. Declares the master Yah of Elohim of hosts. For in the day I visit Israel for their transgressions. I shall also punish concerning the slaughter places of Beit El. So they're in spiritual adultery here. And the horns of the slaughter place shall be broken. And they shall fall to the ground. Do you see what you are saying here? You have been in spiritual adultery so long, I've sent you prophet after prophet to repent, and in fact, all you've done is get worse. I'm going to break off the horns of the altar, which means you've got nowhere to run to hold on to and beg for mercy. This is really cutting language, what you are saying. Willful rebellion. And spiritual adultery is actually only tolerated for so long. Remember what the Yom Kippur ceremony was about, the sins of ignorance. Now, does rebellion get forgiven? Does the blood of Messiah cover all transgression? Yes. Including rebellion and spiritual adultery. Because if not, we're toast. 
But is it only tolerated for so long? What's the biblical pattern over and over again? Eventually, the hammer comes down. Look, you even see it with the great tribulation. You know, these, these, uh, these great judgments are happening on the earth. But then it says, the people receiving these, rather than repent, they curse Elohim. And they do not repent of their drug sorceries and their idolatries. It's not until you have the, the resurrection of the resurrection, you see it with the two witnesses, but also, I believe, the resurrection in general, People see that and fear and give glory to God. There seems to be some that do repent. But that's like literally after that, you're done. Because the next, if that's happening in between the resurrection and Yom Kippur, the next thing on the prophetic clock, Yeshua is coming back and treading a wine press. And anyone that does survive, you have a judgment of sheep and goats. We'll cover this tomorrow. Willful rebellion and spiritual adultery is only tolerated for so long. Eventually he gives you over to your heart's desire. Hence Pharaoh's heart being hardened. He hardened his own heart the first four or five times. Yah said, you want to go that way? Have at it. For this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion. Right? Because they did not believe in the truth. And this is what Yah is saying to the northern kingdom. I'm going to take away your ability to even grab hold of the horns. Not that it would make any difference. Because Yah is righteous. And Yah says back in Exodus, if it's someone that's calculatedly murdered someone, you take him away and you kill him. Elohim took away from the house of Israel the ability to grab hold of the horns of the altar. Why? Spiritual adultery. He's punishing them concerning the, uh, the altars at Beitel. What was at Beitel in the northern kingdom? The, uh, golden calf. There was a golden calf there and there was a golden calf in the northern lands of Dan. And you are saying, I've had enough. You're meant to be my people. You're sleeping with a prostitute. Sorry. You're going to eat your own words now. Much like what happened to Joab. I believe, so, this is all intertwined to Yom Kippur. This is all intertwined. Because what does Yom Kippur point to? Yom Kippur points for atonement, but it's also the wrath. I'm sorry, but when the wrath has come, that's it. You're out of time. Hide us from the face of the Lamb, for his wrath has come, they'll cry out, right? They know their toast. And that's what the sprinkling of the blood on the horns of the altar points to. By the way, there's a link, if, if that's the altar of incense and prayer, there's, there's something about this, the blood covering our prayers. You know, you know when Paul says, we know not what we ought to pray, but the Spirit intercedes on our behalf? <laughs> It's like, I believe Paul is getting this language from the Torah, from the sacrificial system. He fully understood it. So again, Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and the sins of ignorance of the people. The set-apart spirit signifying this, that the way into the most set-apart place was not yet made manifest, while the first tent has a standing which was a parable. It's, it's a parable. The, the Greek there is, is parable, actually. For the present time in which both gifts and slaughters are offered, which are unable to perfect the one serving as to his conscience. They understood that these were a shadow pict picture. Only as to food and drinks and different washings and fleshly regulations imposed until a time of setting matters straight. But Messiah having become a high priest of the coming good matters through the greater and more perfect tent not made with hands that is not of this creation entered into the most set apart place once and for all 
not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting redemption. Again, notice it's using, the, um, this is sinless blood. And the, the, the whole ritual of atonement pointed forward to this. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the defiled sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh, by the way, flesh and blood doesn't get to inherit the kingdom, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the everlasting spirit offered himself unblemished to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim? This is what the blood of animals could never do. It was a parable, as the book of Hebrews puts it. For when, according to Torah, every command had been spoken by Moshe to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant which Elohim commanded you. Now, this is a shadow picture of the covenant which was brought in by his blood. In the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and all the vessels of service. Now, in a house, there are vessels of honour and vessels of dishonour. Do, do you see what this is pointing to? Everything in the house, in the tabernacle, which we are, needs to be sprinkled by the blood. And according to the Torah, almost all is cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's a mistranslation. What happens if you were too poor to be able to bring an animal? What could you bring to the tabernacle? Grain. There's no blood in grain. So if this English translation is correct, if you're a pauper, sorry, no forgiveness. The word there is aphesis in the Greek. It means release. With that, so let's hold on to that. It was necessary then that the copies of the heavenly ones should be cleansed with these, but the heavenly ones themselves with better slaughter offerings than these. So here, the word aphesis, it means release from bondage or imprisonment. Forgiveness or pardon of sins. Now, remission of the penalty. When we think of forgiveness, we think of it being rubbed out. The word aphesis or release means that you were set free from it. It's there, but you were set free from it. This is why Yah says your sin will be as far from the east as it is to the west. You're being released from it. This is why Paul says you were servants of sin, but now you are servants of righteousness. This is pointing to the jubilee. By the way, the word aphesis, like uh, the, the, whoever was reading this letter was not thinking, oh, the blood of Messiah forgives me. It was thinking the blood of Messiah institutes the ju jubilee. Why do we know this? Leviticus 25. You shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times a year, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. And you shall then sound a shofar sound on the tenth day of the seventh new moon on Yom HaKippurim, cause a shofar to sound throughout all the land. And you shall set the 50th year apart and proclaim release. The Hebrew there is daror, okay? Daror. Throughout all the land to all its inhabitants, it is a yovel or a jubilee. For you, each one shall return to his possession and each of you return to his clan. Now in the Septuagint, the Greek version of this, the word daror is aphesis, which is what's the word, without the shedding of blood, there is no aphesis, there is no release. Daror. And then the Greek for the... Um, word yovel, in the Greek you actually have the year of aphesis, that's what the Greek says. So instead of, they don't have a word for the jubilee, it becomes the year of release. 
So the writer of Hebrews is saying, without the shedding of blood, and he's speaking, what was the context? Messiah cleansing the tabernacle. He's saying, without the shedding of that blood, there is no jubilee. And it's not talking of the shadow picture jubilee. What is the jubilee even pointing to? I'm glad you ask. Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the master Yah is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release. Again, the Hebrew there is the roh, but the Greek equivalent is aphesis in the Septuagint. To the captives and to the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yah and the day of vengeance of our Elohim, to come for all who mourn. This is one of the ways you know that the day of vengeance occurs on Yom Kippur, because it's using Jubilee language to, to tell you when it's happening. To appoint unto those who mourn in Zion, to give them embellishment for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and they shall be called trees of righteousness, a planting of Yah to be adorned. If you read the rest of the chapter, it's telling you, it talks about the millennial kingdom. That this jubilee is, is the eschatological jubilee. It's what the, the jubilee scriptures were pointing to. You're being set free from sin. You're being set free from death. You're being given your land back, right? And they shall rebuild the old ruins, raise up the former waste, and they shall restore the ruined cities, the wastes of many generations. The initial few, well, the initial part of the millennial reign is rebuild. Remember that the, the wrath of Yahs just decimated the earth. The strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the foreigner be your plowmen and your vine dressers. But you shall be called priests of Yah. Servants of our Elohim shall be said of you. You shall consume the strength of the nations and boast in their esteem. We're not priests of Yah yet. Look at how not white my garments are. <laughs> This is how you now this is ushered in through the Jubilee. This is what the, the stipulations of the shadow picture Jubilee were all pointing to. And that is by his blood. As the book of Hebrews says, without blood there is no Jubilee. Had Messiah not paid the price, there's no plan of redemption. Now notice that the ushering in, okay, you need the blood to usher in the jubilee, right? This is what Hebrews is saying. And Isaiah is saying that this jubilee is going to usher in a priesthood, okay? Here, priests of Yah. And then we read this in Revelation, you know, that those who overcome shall be kings and priests. Let's pull on that thread a bit more. Exodus 29, this is the task you shall do to set them apart who are to serve to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams, perfect ones. Then you shall bring Aharon and his sons to the door of the tent of appointment and wash them with water. You shall take the garments, shall put them on Aharon, the long shirt, the robe of the shoulder garment, the shoulder garment, the breastplate, and he shall gird himself with the embroidered band of the shoulder garment, and he shall put the turban on his head, and shall put the set-apart sign of dedication on the turban, and shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put long shirts on them. So what you're seeing is the inauguration of the priesthood here. And shall gird them with girdles, Aharon and his sons, and put turbans on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs for an everlasting law. So you shall order Aharon and his sons. Now this is a type in shadow. Right? The Torah is a type in shadow pointing to the way to your matter. And you shall bring near the bull before the tent of appointment. And Aharon and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. And you shall slay the bull before Yah by the door of the tent of appointment. And shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it where? On the horns 
of the slaughter place with your finger. Part of the inauguration of the priesthood was the blood was sprinkled on the horns of the altar and pour all the blood beside the base of the slaughter place. It sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And take one ram and Aharon and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram and you shall slay the ram and you shall take its blood and sprinkle it all around the slaughter place. And you shall take the second ram, again like you've got two of the same animal again, there's a parallel. And Aharon and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall slay the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aharon and on the tip of the right ear of his sons and on the thumb of their right hand and on their big toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood all around on the slaughter plate. You shall take some of the blood that is on the slaughter place and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aharon and on his garments. Think think of the oil, you know, um, being linked to the ruach and the crushing of your lives. And then you've got the blood of Messiah. Those who have made their garments white in the blood of the Lamb. And he and his garments shall be set apart and his sons and the garments of his sons with him. The blood sprinkled on the priests was that of a ram, okay? That was part of the inauguration. Now, here's what's really interesting about the ram. Again, I actually believe there's a parallel here to the Yom Kippur ceremony because of the blood being put on the horns of the altar. But notice here is the blood of a ram that sprinkled on the priests. The ram's used for another type of offering. Leviticus 5, verse 17. When any being sins and has done what is not to be done against any of the commands of Yah, though he knew it not. Oh, what was that? A sin of ignorance. What's being atoned for on the day of atonement? The sins of ignorance of the priesthood and the nation. We're now talking about an individual, okay? This is now on the individual level. Because for the priest, it was a bull. For the nation, it was a bull. Here we're talking on the individual level. Yet he shall be guilty and bear his crookedness. Then he shall bring to the priest a ram, a perfect one, from the flock with your valuation as a guilt offering. The word there for guilt is a sham. Bear this in the back of your mind. But it was a ram that was used to bring the ordination of the priests. Now, what is a ram? Yeah, it's a matured lamb. (laughs) When Yeshua came the first time, he came as a lamb. Is he coming as a meek old lamb the second time? No, (laughs) far from it. The priest shall make atonement for his mistake. He committed unintentionally, though he did not know it, and it shall be forgiven him. It is a guilt offering. He was truly guilty before he up. Notice it's the blood of a ram here, which is a matured sheep. It's a male sheep at that. So it's got this idea of matured headship um, as a guilt offering and a sham. Isaiah 53, verse 10. But Yah was pleased to crush him. He laid sicknesses on him. Then when he made his soul an offering for guilt, the word there is a sham. He would see a seed, he would prolong his days and the pleasure of Yah prosper in his hand. If you read earlier on in the prophecy, it says, he shall likewise sprinkle many nations. Some trans, most English translations have startle there. The word there for, in the Hebrew actually means to sprinkle and it's the same word used of the priest sprinkling blood in the tabernacle. You mean the servant, the suffering servant, is going to sprinkle many nations? Of course. Sovereigns shut their mouths at him. For what what had not been recounted to them, they shall see. And what they had not heard, they shall understand. What I'm saying is that the inauguration of the priesthood, as a shadow picture, needed a guilt offering. It needed a ram, which was also used as a guilt offering. What's it pointing to? What I'm trying to say is that, the, you know it said without the shedding of blood, there is no jubilee. 
Well, if that's the shadow picture and without the blood of Messiah, there's no eschatological jubilee, let's take it one step further. Without the blood of Messiah, there's no priesthood. What did the 24 elders say? By your blood, we have been redeemed from the earth and served day and night before the throne. Notice I've put fulfilling the atonement of Yom Kippur. Because when did Messiah spill his blood? What appoints Passover? And people get a bit hung up. Oh, well, that was back then. He paid the price. He paid the price. What's the, what's the fulfilment of Yom Kippur, actually? When you're talking... When you're thinking of the fulfillment of the spring Moedim, we're thinking death of Messiah, buried, resurrected, and then the outpouring of the Ruach. We're yet waiting for the fall ones. What's going to happen on Yom Kippur at fall? Treading of the wine press, the wrath. The, the fulfillment of the atonement part, what, Yom, what the Yom Kippur ceremony was pointing to. Remember that all of it points to Messiah. All of it points to Messiah. Matthew 17, 27, verse 17. So when they were assembled, Pilate said to them, Whom do you wish I release to you, Barabbas or Yeshua, who is called Messiah? Now, Barabbas can mean two things, depending what language, whether you go in Hebrew or Aramaic. Son of the Father, Bar Abba. And it can also mean son of the teacher if you have Bar Rabban. Okay, now was Yeshua the son of the father? Yes. Was he the teacher? Yes. He's the rabbi, right? Ancient manuscripts of this passage actually have the full name of Barabbas as Yeshua Barabbas. Barabbas. People freak, you know, Yeshua was a really common name back in the first century, very common. Seems to be very common in South America, right? Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Oregon, a so-called church father, I say that very loosely, was troubled that his manuscript of the Gospels had Barabbas' name as Yeshua Barabbas and declared that a heretic must have added Yeshua to it, declaring it was impossible for a criminal to have such a holy name. You see the name Yeshua come up in the book of Ezra. You see it come up in the book of ne Nehemiah. It's, it's, it's a name. It just means salvation. It means salvation. So, but when you understand what you're seeing, so you're seeing Yeshua, you're seeing Yeshua, One's about to bear the sin of the world. Are you now maybe seeing a parallel to the Yom Kippur ceremony? The problem with this logic is that Yeshua is a common name in that time. Very common. Let's look at uh, Barabbas. There was one called Barabbas chained with his fellow rebels who had committed murder in the uprising. We read over this stuff, but when you understand what was going on in the first century with the zealots... The word here for rebels, um, sustasiestes, a companion in insurrection, a fellow rioter, an insurgent. So it's got this militant idea to it. We get another clue in Luke. Away with this one, released was Barabba, who had been thrown into prison for a certain uprising made in the city and for murder. So now it's telling you what kind of rebel he was. We'll get to this, but it, like, we get these little clues here. John 18, 40, they shouted again saying, not this one, but Barabba, and Barabba was a robber. That's a really poor translation of the Greek there. It can mean robber, plunderer, freebooter, or a brigand, a revolutionary, an insurrectionist, a guerrilla. Was there a Jewish community that was ticked off with Rome in the first century? Yeah. Barabba was a zealot, and the fact that he was a murderer means we know he was a Sicari, which was a splinter group of the zealots. The Sicaris would murder even their own people. 
to get the the achieve to get the their goals done. So people like if you would have had a Jewish person then become friendly with the Roman Empire, guess who murdered them? And what the Sicarius would do, they would murder key people in the government structure. We now, from piecing these things together, we know that um, Barabbas was part of the Zealots and the Sicarii. Now what's really interesting, the Sicarii worshipped the correct God. They had messianic theology. They were waiting for Messiah. And part of their theology is very similar in a way to some of the extreme groups of Islam where they bring on the advent of Messiah. If we do this, if we bring war, if we do that, it will speed the coming of their, of their anointed one. And that was their th the idea. To the point when Jerusalem is surrounded in 70 AD, they, um, they burnt down all their own food supply. They prevented people from going in and out and they destroyed their own food supply because Messiah is going to come. He has to save Jerusalem. They couldn't put it in their mind that they'd maybe got their theology a bit and their eschatology a bit wonky. But they were worshipping the right God. Well, you could argue they were worshipping self, but whole other story. The point I'm trying to say is they were in the camp. Barabbas was in the camp. He was of the house of Israel. He was of the house of Israel. So you have two Israelites, both called Yeshua, both sons of a father. Do you see, you're being given a choice. I believe there is an allusion here to the Yom Kippur ceremony. An allusion. This is a clear parallel to the two goats of Yom Kippur. Yeshua, in this particular moment, he's the goat on which the lot for Elohim fell because he had to be slain. And then the carcass is taken outside the camp, so to speak. But I believe that Yeshua also fulfilled the requirements for the scapegoat because our sin was laid upon him and he was led outside the camp. These are illusions, they're shadows. Again, who is our high priest? Messiah is our high priest. It was the high priest and the high priest alone that had to do the order of Yom Kippur. It's commanded, only he can do it. And to do so, he has to take off his garments of glory and put on white garments. For a little while, he was made lower than the angels. He came in flesh. And then he put the garments back on at his ascension. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. The high priest was the only one to officiate the ceremony. Yeshua is our high priest. He literally did it all. All he asks of us is to repent and to humble ourselves. And if we are going to grab hold of the horns of the altar, let it be for the right reasons. Let's not try and justify it away like Joab. Adonia, he actually usurped the king. Think of the typology. He usurped the king, which is like, that's treason. That's treason. But yet he was able to repent. Why? Because he, he, he just bowed. The high priest had to take off the high priestly garb and wear regular priestly clothing. Elohim came in the flesh. One Peter one, verse seventeen. If you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, pass the time of your sojourning in fear, knowing that you were redeemed from your futile behaviour inherited from your fathers, not with what is corruptible, silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Messiah, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless. And I believe, well, Paul flat out says it, it's over and over. You are redeemed from sin and death. You are released from it. Hence the Jubilee language. Now, if we've been redeemed, who's our redeemer? Messiah's our redeemer. The redeemer has two roles to play, not one. Two. People miss this out. Leviticus 25. Now, Leviticus 25, the context of it is the Jubilee years. It, it goes through the Shemitah years, the seven years, but it also goes through the Jubilees. 
It's what we were reading from earlier. But when you keep reading, then you get this thing of the Redeemers. So redemption is linked within the same passage as the Jubilee. When a sojourner or a settler with you becomes rich and your brother with him becomes poor and sells himself to the settler or sojourner with you to, or to a member of the sojourner's clan, after it has been sold, there is a right of redemption to him. One of his brothers does redeem him. Now, the word to redeem in the Hebrew, the verb is ga'al. And the right of redemption is a ge'ula. Okay, so it comes from this word ga'al. This is where the idea of the redeemer being the goel comes from. Or his uncle, or his uncle's sons does redeem him. Or anyone who is a close relative to him in his clan does redeem him. Or if he is able, then he shall redeem himself. Only blood family was allowed to, um, to redeem a, a relative. And it had to be the closest member possible. This is what you see with the story of Ruth, right? Ruth and the kinsman redeemer. There was actually someone closer than Boaz to Naomi in terms of, but he took his sandal off, which by the way would have brought great shame, and Boaz then took her. Numbers 35, 19, the revenger of blood, the Goel Hadam. It, like, Goel is its own word in Hebrew. Like, we... It means both the redeemer, but it also means revenger. Goel is a, is a function. It's a job title, as it were. The revenger of blood himself puts the murderer to death. Where he meets him, he puts him to death. So if someone was murdered, the clo again, the closest member of the family was allowed to avenge the blood or to redeem the blood. It sounds weird when you put it that way, but it had to be a close relative. But if that person accidentally killed someone he could go to his city of refuge right and be protected from this guy but anyway the 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 goel the redeemer has two functions to redeem to revenge isaiah 44 22 this is yah speaking i shall wipe out your transgressions like a cloud well we've just looked at hopefully that should make sense and your sins like a mist, return to me, for I shall redeem you. Point blank, Yah will redeem us. Sing, O heavens, for Yah shall do it. Shout, O depths of the earth. So it's been linked to Yom Teruah here. Break forth into singing, mountains, forests, and every tree in it, for Yah shall redeem Yaakov and make himself clear in Yisrael. Thus said Yah, your redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb, there's a really interesting thing in the Hebrew there. Uh, I won't go there. I am, I am Yah doing all, stretching out the heavens all alone, spreading out the earth with none beside me. Now, here again, Isaiah, look, I'm just choosing some snapshots. Now, the reason I brought this one up is because it's in the context of Yom Teruah, shouting, redemption. And we covered this in the Yom Teruah teaching. Where is your death, O oh, sting, right? And when is death overcome for us? When that shofar blows. For your maker is your husband. Yah of hosts is his name. And the set apart one of Yisrael is your redeemer. He is called the Elohim of all the earth. But now thus said Yah, your creator, O Yaakov, and he who formed you, O Yisrael, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by a name, you are mine. So th this is just a snapshot of Yah being our redeemer. And hopefully in light of the Yom Teruah teaching, we understand we're being redeemed from death. We see over and over again, Yah being our revenger. Why is there red on your raiment and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? So now you're going to see the other function of the Redeemer. I have trodden the winepress alone and from the peoples no one was with me. And I trod them down in my displeasure and I trampled them in my wrath. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments. I have defiled all my raiment. For a day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. 
It sounds, what we think of this, yeah, Yah's redeemed us from sin and death. This is speaking Jubilee language. When it's saying the year of my redeemed has come, it's in the context of vengeance. It should, like, let me put it this way in the, Hebrew, in the English, the year of my ones I've took vengeance for. Because remember the goel had two functions. It's the same word in the Hebrew, to redeem and to get in the goel hadam, the revenger of blood. The year of his redeemed has come. Yeah, he's going to revenge himself. Nahum 1.2 Yah is a jealous and revenging El. Yah is a revenger and a possessor of wrath. Yah takes vengeance on his adversaries and he watches for his enemies. Deuteronomy 32, 43. O nations, proclaim his people, acclaim his people, for he avenges the blood of his servants and returns vengeance to his adversaries and shall pardon his land, his people. If you don't see Yom Kippur and redemption right there, and I mean redemption in terms of vengeance, it's right there. When was the pardon, right? When was the blood? <laughs> the Torah, however, explicitly states that the Goel must be the closest blood relative of the one being redeemed or avenged. Yah's God, we're men. And there's a problem. We're now no longer related. We're not of the same substance. A goat couldn't redeem a man. That's the, that was the problem with the sacrificial system, right? Our scriptures tell us countless times that Yah will redeem and avenge us, but you have to be related to the one that you're redeeming. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with Elohim, and the Word was Elohim. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. And we saw his esteem, esteem as have only brought forth of a father, complete in favour and truth. This is how, this is why every prophecy in the Tanakh that is attributed to Yah, you see it's Yeshua doing it in the Tanakh. Because the only way Yah can redeem and revenge is if he's of the same nature of the ones he's redeeming and revenging. Again, our high priest did it all. So, what does Yom Kippur look? This is just a, a snapshot. We, we've barely scratched the surface. Our king came in the flesh so that he could redeem us from sin and death and to avenge us. That's what Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur are about. The, the, the blood was spilt at Passover, which allowed the, the redemption to occur. Then you have a resurrection occurring. On, well, that's the redemption from death. Yom Kippur, you see the, the revenge. And you see the enacting of the Jubilee. His sinless blood cleansed the set-apart place. We are that set-apart place. Remember, going back to the start of the teaching... It, the blood that was brought into the tabernacle of the bull and of that goat, there was no transferal or confession of sin over it. It was blood that had no record of sin. The shadow picture is telling you it had to be someone sinless to redeem man. His blood is what will consecrate his priesthood. He's in a, like, it was in a sham offering, the, the, the guilt offering. You sh and then in Isaiah 53, it says that Messiah will be the guilt offering. He's going to have a priesthood with him ruling and reigning. Well, guess what? It needs to be inaugurated. And how was the priesthood inaugurated? It was sprinkled with blood. Oh, wait, he will sprinkle many nations. The sin of the cosmos, the creation, creation was laid upon him, though he was innocent. Again, he's bearing like the goat in the Yom Kippur ceremony did diddly squat. It took the sin and off it went. So let me ask you this. Did you choose to be born fallen? No. Which means we've, we've done this question game a lot. Who chose for you to be born fallen? 
Yah, it's okay to say it. Yah chose for you to be born fallen. Here's the real question. Has he taken accountability, responsibility and consequence for that choice? Yes. It's called your Messiah. He has taken accountability, responsibility. Like you didn't choose to be even born, let alone born fallen. He's ta- like, so it's like, again, he's not expecting us to be perfect. He's expecting us to be faithful. He's taking care of that. Today means, without what we're talking about today, no plan of redemption, without the blood of Messiah, like, like we wouldn't even be here now. You know, this goes so deep. It goes so deep. Like, what we've covered today is just the scratch of the surface. I've been alluding a lot recently to stuff, you know, prior creation, eternity. This points to all of this, by the way. Like, truly knowing Elohim's desire. But this idea of him taking accountability, him taking responsibility, and paying the consequence. Only our faith has an Elohim like that. Because in all the other faiths and religions, the gods need to be placated or they're capricious. Or you need to buy them out with some kind of favour. Our king says, there's nothing you can do, just repent. I love you, repent. So, if we are going to cling onto the horns of the altar, if we are going to cling onto the garment of our Messiah, let it be for the right reason. Because it's not a get out of jail free card, as some sects of religion will teach you. Do not trample the blood that you were bought with. Spiritual adultery will only be tolerated for so long. And the choice we have now is, are we going to rid ourselves of the leaven? And are we going to get out of the bed of that whore, the religious mystery Babylon, that strange woman? And are we going to be faithful to our king? Because... Not only has he done it all, but he's done it at a level way above what we have to go through. His level of accountability is so high. To the point that eternity would have been at stake. Anyway, let's stop here. Amen.